Please join me in welcoming uh, Werner Westermann, who is uh, from the uh, Congress Library in Chile. And um, when I was reading through uh, Werner's profile, something caught my eye. Uh, and it was the way he was describing his work in himself. And uh, when he said, kidnapped by open uh, technologies and practices to amplify access and raise quality in learning and teaching, I was wow. So again, a warm welcome, Werner, uh, with his talk to help with curriculum. What next? Buenas noches, Verna. The floor is yours. Hello. Thank you, Shahida, for your, for your very kind uh, presentation. And I'm very happy to be part of the OER camp. Um, I really love the OER camp. Um, I think in, It, 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 I think uh, it's lagging behind um, with, the, with the progress of uh, open education. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the K-12 sector, uh, which has not have the same uh, progress as higher education, for example. So uh, OER Camp uh, has always had this, uh, this vocation related to K-12, so I'm very happy to participate. I had a very great uh, session two years ago, so hopefully they, that can uh, happen today. Uh, let me just share the screen. Now. Okay, so uh, I'm Werner Westermann. I, um, I work at the Library of Congress of Chile. I, I'm a teacher, I'm a history teacher. So um, that's why K-12 is, is part of my, my, my biggest passion. And uh, uh, before we tackle this issue of sending curriculum to hell, um, I, I, I want to, uh, to, to spotlight, uh, I think what is going to be one of the major challenges uh, after this pandemic uh, slows down uh, whenever that would happen. Uh, but uh, the issue of the learning loss that our youth and our children are experiencing in this uh, now two years, and, and, and we can extend that to, to maybe next year, that it's, we're only just having a sneak of, of, of the real impact around the, uh, what pandemic has done uh, by closing the, the schools in, 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 in almost every country. Um, how much is this learning loss? The concept of, 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 of learning loss, uh, it relates uh, to a learner that kind of forgets or, or, or dismisses the, the prior learning especially the year, the year before, at least that this is how the World Bank tries to measure the, this negative impact in learning. And um, last year, uh, a very astonishing um, report came out, the World Bank with the uh, Ministry of Education in Chile, and that the learning loss of our students in average is about 88% of the prior learning. Of course, the, that learning loss, it's, it's even greater in, in, in the poorest um, sector of, of our society, getting up to 95%. That's almost losing all the prior learning of the year before. You might think that the richest people, the, the people have the better uh, conditions for learning, it wouldn't the, the negative impact wouldn't be so 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 much, but it is very high at least. It, this report is stated that sixty four percent of the uh, of our of that that sector of society, the best prepared, uh, would lose up to sixty four percent in average. So, and and. And that interesting issue is that 
we tried to give continu continuity of the learning process by shifting from, from the face-to-face -face modality uh, in schools uh, towards online connected learning experience. But this report really stated that the, the, the online education does not have the same uh, uh, effect uh, mitigating the, uh, the closure of schools. And, uh, and, uh, and so online education has been an, em in an emergency response, but it cannot be the final response. So we need to be looking ahead around this learning loss. Um, continuing um, related to this learning loss, uh, this is a, a report that just came out uh, a month ago. And um, looking to strive on what would be the strategies to try to uh, take into account and uptake this learning loss. This is a, a report from the World Bank as well uh, with UNESCO and UNICEF. And um, it, they, they brought up, they bring up this concept about learning poverty that would be much more than it was before the pandemic, uh, up to 70%. So, so now we have real evidence-based data that around those, uh, that learning loss, we know that our children are losing learning in math more than they do in reading, and obviously affects the most vulnerable um, sectors of society, like the, uh, especially the low-income uh, backgrounds and girls. Girls, so we have this gender uh, negative impact also within this learning loss. So, and when this report kind of gives the strategies to, to overcome this learning loss, I, I'd like to, to highlight this, uh, this discussion around curriculum, um, which is what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, so we need to get uh, uh, these uh, learning recovery strategies going and uh, curriculum cannot uh, be something that we skip we need to uptake from, from the curriculum side. So, but as distance learning has showed how, showed the most deeper inequalities that our countries have, um, and seeing that distance learning cannot be the final solution for the K-12 sector, uh, this, is, this is due First of all, for the lack uh, of digital skills for teachers and learners, there's, there's, there's always this assumption that learners are, are very skilled with the use of technology. It may be so for social networks, but for, for, for the experience of learning, it, it's, it's, uh, we can see that our, our children are, are very limited trying to use the digital space for, for learning. But moreover, uh, the lack of skills, I think the, it, it, it's the material conditions uh, for home-based learning that hasn't had, that's, that has avoided that online education has had a better impact uh, within this. Uh, so when we talk about material conditions, we just think, um, the, the conditions at home, you know, to, 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 to think about home being a place where you have to learn, we just shocked. To learn. So, so education within this uh, crisis, this sanitary. The purpose, the, the, we, we're in front of a crisis of a purpose around education. And one of the, the symptoms that we can see about this crisis of purpose 
of, 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 of our schools, first of all, is a very disconnected curriculum. Uh, it's, it's a curriculum based on subjects. It's very extensive, uh, very saturated as, as, uh, as we can uh, conceive in, 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 uh, in very fragmented. There's very, the, all subjects in, in the K-12 sphere are like silos, unconnected silos. So, so that type of curriculum within this, this context of, of, of a sanitary crisis, it just, it, it just, uh, it wasn't any type of, uh, it, it was unuseful for uh, our children. There was a disconnection between the context and what uh, the educational objective, ob objectives should uh, should go through. So we we, we have seen uh, a, a, a gap that has widened between what what we can effectively do uh, with our children and create experiences uh, of uh, high quality learning and the curriculum. So many teachers, uh, as as and maybe some of you, just said with, you know, to hell with curriculum, we don't need it. Um, and, and, and our teachers are, have, have really started to, to try to look new ways in, in, on how to, uh, to perceive um, their, their own job. This in the context where curriculum has always been like the lighthouse for, for, for teachers. You know, curriculum is it's it's it, it's a corpse of uh, of knowledge that kind of guides the f the the function and the role of teachers with uh, with students. So 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 one of the things that we we we, we kind of acknowledge with this crisis with this crisis of purpose of education is that. Um, Our curriculum was thought and was developed for a face-to-face -face modality. So the curriculum, it just ran into a wall uh, through a distance learning mo 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 modality. So we kind of acknowledge and say, we don't have the same time of, 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 le of a learning setting so we can work with the curriculum. So many teachers just pull it aside, but ministries uh, re reacted, many ministries, and I'm talking specifically about my country, Chile, uh, they reacted trying to prioritize the curriculum. As, as we acknowledged that we had less time uh, for the learning experience, we have to reduce learning objectives. So basically, it was a reduction that had some type of a, a criteria uh, where, where uh, we, we had to take the learning objectives that were really indispensable from a disciplinary perspective and the pertinency and integration of, of these learning objects, objectives. Um, Maybe you're already asking yourself, who can, who, who can really say what's indispensable about this uh, discipline? Um, maybe in some disciplines, like I'm thinking about mathematics, it, 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 it can be, you, you can have a very standardized way to, to find those very core knowledges that, that you need to, to learn. But the pertinency and integration, who can say what's more pertinent for one educational context from another? So questions start to arise when, when and, and when, at least when we looked at our prioritized uh, curriculum, we kind of felt it was more than a cut. Uh, then, then uh, so this is not a new curriculum. It, it's, it was more than a chopped uh, curriculum, but to give you an example, uh, 
for example, science subject in fourth grade uh, had 61 learning objectives. That showing how saturated and so uh, so content driven uh, our curriculum was, and with the prioritization, prioritization that came down to eight learning objectives. So so it was a, a really trimmed um, effort from the ministries to to to, to prioritize our, our curriculum. And, and, and this is something that's it's going to, uh, to happen as well in, in next year. It, it's been confirmed officially that the ministry will, uh, will push this prioritized curriculum. And many are, are starting to think that this, will, this prioritized curriculum should be the, the real curriculum. The ministry is, is, is it's, it's very hectic about, around that. They insist that this is not a new curriculum, but so, so things started. So when we, uh, people from uh, open education here in Chile, try to think about how to contribute to, uh, to this prioritized curriculum said, Hey, we, we, we have an opportunity here. We can we can align offline. Uh, I'm sorry. We can align OER pre-existing OER to our official uh, curriculum, so we can have a response uh, from the open education sector um, to this prioritized curriculum. So, uh, and we also thought about. Uh, uh, thinking that with these material conditions that our students didn't have in their homes, we needed to make uh, alternative uh, ways of delivering a learning experience. Moreover, the, the connected learning. So we thought that offline resources was a really good option uh, to tackle these, uh, these problems that are children uh, confronted and uh, and when when you think about offline OER you cannot think of anything else than Calibri. Calibri is a wonderful platform um, uh, for uh, um, managing and, and creating offline uh, open educational resources. Calibri is it, it's a learning platform it has a, a bunch of features, but I would like to, to stress that you can create wonderful offline channel, OER channels, which, which is a sequence of, a di of, of, of different uh, OERs. And, and it also has very interesting interactive content, which I think it's, it's the way to go. Uh, this do that some uh, some uh, OER uh, projects or initiative has gone a long way. We have very good, high quality uh, OER available. So, so uh, that's why we chose uh, Colibri to, to work around this idea of, of creating a curricular response to this prioritized uh, curriculum. So, so, we decided that we had to make a, a create a, a you know, in offline OER channel. We selected math because we know that's that's where we have the 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 the, the, the more quantity of resources available. And and we started to work. We started working from fifth grade to tenth grade, and then and and and, and really found a lot. Of, uh, of OER uh, that we could reuse uh, aligning uh, to our uh, cur uh, prioritized curriculum. And we ended up creating... Vanna, you, we lost you for a second, but please feel free to continue. Okay. So we were talking about this... Thank you. This OER math channel as a response for the prioritized curriculum from first grade to 12th grade. So we, we ended up 
creating an OER channel for math to all the 12 uh, levels of, uh, of K-12. And uh, we we're very happy to have 100% curricular coverage. That is to have OER respond, responsive to every learning objective of the prioritized curriculum. And um, this doesn't mean that this OER channel cannot enhanced and upgraded. We do have some, some scarcity in some specific areas like geometry and, and statistics. And, and, and in general, we have very little, we, we, don't, we don't have a sense of uh, OER in Spanish. So that's something we have to, but in, in the case of math, uh, we, had a, we had a good deal. So We created this uh, for the Ministry of Education, and they decided to dis distribute this OER math channel uh, to rural schools because they already had Calibri pre-installed. So uh, the ministry committed to, to distribute uh, in this content access point. Was, uh, schools. And we also, the ministry committed to distribute uh, this OER channel um, to an offline of, uh, of solution for the, the ministry's repository of, of learning digital resources. So they, they built an offline solution for that. And that was also uh, installed with uh, Calibri and this this uh, solution, this tailored solution for our prioritized curriculum. And um, with that great experience, we also took on the challenge to work around uh, the curriculum alignment of OER for Honduras in, in, tenth, in seventh and to ninth grade. So that was also a, a great experience. We'll be talking about that. So what, what this initiative really uh, showed us is that we have a lot of uh, opportunities for curriculum development from the OER or the open education sector. Um, the curriculum alignment, which is trying to match a learning objective, which is uh, stated in the curriculum, how to match that learning objective with an OER that can contribute for uh, the performance of that learning objective. And um, with that reuse uh, strategies uh, and alongside a powerful infrastructure, we can really speed up the process of creating curriculum. We didn't took more than three months creating this K-12, uh, a full K-12 uh, curriculum alignment. And, and that was really wonderful to, to, to see. And, and, and for that, Calibri <coughs> has a very interesting infrastructure so, to, to make this happen. Not only having all these great sources of OER where we can uh, create these channels, but having a, a web-based platform that can be collaborative, that can steer participation, where we can reuse, where we can remix, and we can also create and license uh, content, it's, um, it, it, it really showed us that we can really steer up the curriculum uh, development. This is kind of, kind of what we did uh, with the Calibri ecosystem. We, ha uh, uh, we have this content library where we have the, the OER. Uh, um, it's, it's like a repository of OER. We can grab those OER and we can assemble them. We can package uh, those OER in the Colorby Studio. And that creates these OER channels that we can dump in the Colibri learning platform uh, where the students uh, meet and, and have their experience. So, so that, that was really cool. And 
but this experience of of of, a, of creating this very extensive OER channel as, as a way to create a a, a curriculum. Uh, um, when you look at the curricular development in a my country, the process of creating curriculum is something that took a couple of decades. Here we have like the like the the two rounds of uh, of curricular development development and the one that we are constructing. Uh, within these days. And, and you can see that it took a lot of time, between 15 and 20 years to create curriculum. And when we hooked up with Honduras, it was basically the same issue. Here's the, here's, uh, um, the different documents related to Honduras curriculum. Um, and, and, and you can see that they took a lot of time to create this. Uh, and, and, and for Honduras, what really struck us that is that the textbook, the last uh, resource created, um, the one in, in 2018, that, that textbook was responsive to the first one. So... So it was, it, was, it was really impactful uh, to see that uh, and, and really questions the coherence of, 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 of resources that are built in such a long uh, lapse of time. I think the consistency of the same curriculum is, is just not the same when you have this very uh, long dated uh, um, development. And we know that can change. So I would, I, I would like to, to propose to you people uh, uh, from this open uh, per, uh, pers perspective. I think an open, an open curriculum development should call of the collective participation of especially end users um, so how can you engage in, in the co-construction and create co-responsibility with all voices of, of the learning and, and, and the educational community, and especially students that have always been marginalized from the construction of a curriculum? I think we need to think that students should be the core issue that we're trying to, to foster. It's their high quality learning that we're pursuing. And, and, and uh, we should build curriculum in this way, uh, calling for part active participation. And we also need flexibility in how we create curriculum so we can manage in, in efficiently, but moreover, how can we adapt to every diverse educational context? We know that one school compared to another, they're just so different. They can be so much different. Um, so we need a curriculum that can adapt to different types of, of, of context. So if we call on, on the participation, especially for the end users of, 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 of our schools, we should foster that, that curricular development through communication and dialogue, trying to reflect and deliberate, and moreover, share practices and resources so we can, uh, so we can build the best curriculum possible. And this last, uh, this is um, more looking ahead, but if we're gonna construct curriculum, we have to have a curriculum that problem, pro problem, problematize and has uh, in question the status quo of, 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 of our realities and in the context of, of, of our children. Um, 
this is also very uh, mindset ch uh, change for schools. Um, schools don't don't like to confront. They, they don't like to treat controversial issues. But we know that the best way to learn about those issues and try to solve them, uh, <clears throat> we have to confront. And, and so that tensional practice, we, we need to, and, and I think we can have that embedded in, in, in our curriculums. <clears throat> so <clears throat> you might be asking yourself, well, why do we need this new way of, uh, is, it, is it just being more efficient and, and, and instead of building a curriculum in 20 years, we can do it in two years? I think the, uh, that's not the core issues. It's not about less time. Uh, it's, it's how curriculum can really be responsive to what society uh, is asking about education we are facing very uncertain and challenging times. We have very complex problems that we need to uptake in, in the near future. And in um, what the pandemic crisis has created is, it's a, uh, I think it's a new educational context. And for that new educational context, we need a new curriculum. We need to think it over in a different way. And not only one curriculum, maybe we need a, many types of curriculums um, in, in, that, can, that can live beside. Uh, for example, having powerful tools and, and very, very efficient tools to create curriculum, we could be building different types of uh, curriculum. For example, do you, do you want to foster science, technology in your students? Hey, let's build a STEM uh, curriculum. Or, or maybe your context wants to strive on developing and preparing your students for uh, acquiring 21st century skills or global citizenship skills or managing data, you know, data is called the petroleum of the 21st century. Shouldn't our students be uh, being uh, educated around data management and analytics, et cetera? The same issue for programming, another interesting uh, trend trying to, maybe we need to build different types of curriculum or have, uh, um, I would say like an infrastructure for building curriculum that can really uh, create different types of curriculum. So we need, we need that our, as we have the need that curriculum can really be responsive for the challenges that our kids are going to face in the future. But only, not only what skills they, they should be acquiring, but also we should be building curriculums that can be responsive to different types of uh, pedagogical uh, methodologies. Like how can we build a curriculum for project-based learning or maybe problem-solving learning or other very interesting um, instructional um, frameworks like design thinking or renewable assignments that which is very, that's very related to open education. So, so that, that's another issue that, that I think we should be uh, um, thinking about when we build curriculum. And also, and, and we just mentioned this, should we build just one curriculum that fits all the students in all the different educational contexts? Why not thinking about building a curriculum more a more tailored, uh, customized curriculum, and maybe a personalized curriculum. Why not? I don't think we're very far from that, especially if we if we reuse uh, very emergent trends like the use of uh, artificial intelligence. We can really steer that type of solutions. 
or we have to start to think how to how to do it. One very important issue related to um, to to this new way of thinking of how to build curriculum, it has to do with how we can digitize curriculum. And I would like to to highlight a very interesting uh, initiative that's promoted by Learning Equality, the, 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 the foundation that develops Colibri, um, where uh, they, they had a joint venture with Google, Vodafone, and the United Nations uh, Unit for Refugees. Refugees, uh, a very uh, low tech and unconnected communities that also need a, so offline uh, resources for them. It's a very interesting, uh, and they've been working around that, that trend. And so what this report uh, uh, kind of gives you, it, give, it gives us uh, a new model so we can digitize curriculum because our curriculums, many of our curriculums are not digitized. Um, our curriculums basically are, uh, are contained by PDFs. Um, and of course that doesn't gives a, give us much, uh, much opportunities around that. And, and not only does this initiative provide a data model so, so we can have like a, open technical standard of how to digitize our curriculum in a very easy way using spreadsheets. The idea is to, uh, is to digitize curriculums and we can centralize them in a repository uh, so we can have, uh, so we can have a, a collaboration between countries, for example or within different uh, curriculums, so. Vanna, two more minutes. Thank you, Jahira. We're, we're closing up to the end. So, this is very interesting because if, if we digitize the, the, the curriculum, we have the chance to really engage and uh, in, in create uh, uh, Curriculums that we can that they can be responsive to to open uh, through open educational resources and and that gives us a very it gives us a context we can we can create these correlations between the standard the curriculum standards with the OER in a more automa automatized way so we can create those creations but not only that because if we if we have different countries with their uh, digitized curriculums, we can do these crosswalks. So one open educational resources can be responsive to the curriculum of one country and another. So, so that gives us a lot of opportunities so we can, so we can create a lot of applications and, and within this uh, curriculum development. And with this slide, I, I, I will be ending. Um, I, I think this curriculum development and how OER and, op and, and openness can really steer up <clears throat> this curriculum development. Our final issue is how can we foster resilient learning systems? And uh, the flexibility of OERs gives us a lot of opportunities so we can create on-demand curriculum, curriculums that can, we can build those uh, uh, curriculums in a very efficient way with less resources and less time, uh, but also being creating very scalable solutions. And, uh, and, 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 and we have to uptake this, this, uh, this modality that I think is gonna stay in our schools, which is this hybrid you know, this, this complementary, co complementary way of uh, creating learning experience 
not only face to face but also connected uh, as well so we need to be creating these uh, um, these I, I think OER and open education are very pertinent strategies so we can contribute to create a, a resilient learning system. We should be facing a lot of crises from now on. So we need to be prepared and be resilient from. So hopefully uh, I can, we can spark a conversation around how OER and openness can contribute for a better curriculum development for our schools. Thank <laughs> you.